Welcome to Training Without Travel Idea Software Training via Practical Application presented jointly by AuditNet and Richard Cascarino and Associates. This webinar is part of the Training Without Travel series covering Idea Software. This webinar covers the importing data, the complete course in all file types and data tricks to get your data ready for analysis. I'm Jim Kaplan, founder and owner of AuditNet, and I will be moderating this webinar. Joining us is Richard Cascarino, Principal of Cascarino & Associates, who will provide you with an overview of how to get started with Idea Data Analysis software from Caseware. This course will teach you to import, combine, and define various types of data into Idea software and understand the difference between the tables and implications for the import process. Let me have Richard introduce himself and give you a brief overview of his background, and then I will cover some housekeeping items for this webinar. Thank you, Jim. Okay, welcome. My name is Richard Cascarino. Um, I'm the principal of Richard Cascarino and Associates, as Jim mentioned. My background, uh, I have a depressing number of years experience in IT and IT audit training and consultancy. I'm a past president of the Institute of Internal Auditors in South Africa, a member of ASACA, member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, and the author of a couple of books including the Auditor's Guide to IT Auditing. Very good Richard. I, I'll go ahead and I'll just cover the basics. Uh, we are recording this webinar today and uh, so if, uh, if you have any questions uh, regarding any, any of the material that's covered please send an email to either Richard or myself after the conclusion of the uh, of the webinar of the recording and we'll be glad to answer your questions at this point I'm going to turn it over to Richard uh, to introduce the agenda and cover the material for today thank you Richard thanks Jim okay for those of you who were here on the previous week we looked at starting off idea how do you start it and where do we start from and we're going to pick up from where we left off on that. So we're going to have a look at the different data types and formats and how you get them into IDEA in the first place. We'll take a look at the different types of file that you can import. We'll look at specifying the record length, specifying field delimiters, looking at field details, creating fields, importing criteria, and appending virtual fields to them. Okay, so what I'm going to do, you've got the slides in front of you. I'm going to drop out of the slides and move across into IDEA, and I will take you through it. And as I take you through it, if you can go online to your version of IDEA and come through it with me. Okay. So that's me in IDEA. For yourselves, if you can start up IDEA and then set the working folder, then the working folder that we're going to use will be your username, my documents IDEA samples, because that's where we're retaining all of the files for the course as we're running it. Okay. I'll give you a couple of seconds so that everyone can get to this page. And we'll start off with a quick resume on where we finished on the last program. We're going to import a file. And to do that, we'll go up to File. We're going to Import Assistant and import to IDEA. The file that we're going to import is a text file, so we'll leave it sitting on text. And it will ask me which file do I wish to import. Down here I can give it the file name, and in this case I'm going to look in my samples folder. Sorry, I beg your pardon, the tutorial folder, and pick up sales.txt. 
I've used the files which come standard with IDEA so that I can be sure that everyone has the same files on hand when we go through the hands-on part. So I'm going to say next and it's told me I have a fixed length file. It's analyzed it and it tells me that's what I think you've got. It's not comma delimited, it's not an ipsodic file. We'll take a look at those later on this morning to determine the differences with those different types of files bringing them in. Now in order to make sense of this you're going to need the file layout and you have the file layout on your next slide. From where we are at the moment I can say next and it tells me I have a 42 character record. If I want to check that, if I make that 43, you'll see I now have everything sitting at an angle. If I take it down to 41, it's going the other way. It's not a cast iron guarantee, but roughly if things are looking like they're in vertical columns, it's probably got it right. Okay. It can get it wrong depending on the nature of the file. So we'll say next. And you can see that we're now sitting with a whole pile of vertical lines. As I move the cursor across, you can see up here, it will show me the column I'm in, and it also shows me the hexadecimal value of that field. Okay. You can see there we have a vertical line running at column 2. Now if you look at the file layout, you'll see the first field is the invoice number which starts in position 1 and runs for 7 characters. So that's in the wrong place. This is IDEA doing its best guess to try and take some of the work off of me as to where the fields actually lie. To remove that, I'll simply double click. If I wish to put it back, a single click puts it back, double click removes it. And I can see I've now got that running out from 1 to 7, which is where it should be. That's my invoice number. My transaction date starts on position 8, which it tells me up here. There's position 8, column 8, and it runs for 8 characters, so it runs out to here. So that line's in the wrong place as well, so I'll remove that one as well. Then comes my payment type and that's four digits and that's correct. Then comes my salesman and that's three digits. Well that's one, two, three. So I need a line in there and I put the line in there. This should be old hat to you because we covered it on the last one. But if you're rusty, let's just go through it together. Then comes my customer number which runs for five characters, so there's one, two, three, four, five. So again, I need another one in there, another vertical line, field separator. Then comes my product code, which is two digits, and then comes my amount. So I'm happy now, I'm sitting with a seven-digit invoice number, six-digit date, four digits payment type, three-digit salesman, five digits customer number, two digits product code, and the rest is the amount. If I get it wrong, I can always go back and fix it. But in the meantime, we're happy with that, so I'll say next. Now it allows me to define each of those individual fields. So the first one I know is my invoice number, and you'll see it says num1, car1, car3, sorry, car2, car3, num4. What it's doing is it's analyzed this and it says that looks like a character field. That looks like numeric. If I look over here, you'll see it says numeric, but if I click on that arrow, these are all the possible permutations because it may have got it wrong. It looks numeric, but it could in fact be a character field. Okay. Now this is a critical point. When you get the information and you get the file layout, 
it is irrelevant whether these are numbers or not. If they've given you a numeric field, you must define it as a numeric field. And if you give it, if they give you it as a character field, you must define it as a character field. Being given a character field and wishing it was numeric doesn't make it numeric. You get what you got. We can manipulate it and we can change it from character into numeric, but it has to be defined in the layout that you were given. And you can see we've got character numbers, we've got dates, we've got ACPAC numbers, ACPAC dates, Benford dates, binary, Burris Pact. All of these are possible types of information which you may be given. In this case, we're happy that it's numbers, so I'm quite happy to leave that as number. It's the invoice number, so there are no decimal places. You can see there, if I left that as a numeric number field, it would be 1 million if I gave it some decimal places. It would be 1 million point zero zero, but we don't have any decimal places, so I'll leave that. The field name, we know, is going to be invoice number, so I'll put in there INV number and you can see it's now plonked it into there. This is a, a technical term that I use, plonked. It's inserted the field name. On the next field is character. It's what I want it to be. Or is it? That's actually a date. So we'll change it to transaction date oops not trans date but trans date and the type is not character it's actually a date field and you can see it's looking for a date mask we can see it's year 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 month month day day and we have that on our file layout. So we'll put that in year, 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 month, month, day, day. Okay, And it tells us that's what the date will look like. Next field is character. We're happy with that. It should be character. And that's our payment type. The next field is our salesman. Again, it's numeric, which it should be, as per my layout. The next field is again numeric, and that's my customer number. The next one says numeric and it's my product code, but we know from the file layout, although that looks like a numeric field, it's not. It's actually a character field. Now, why does that matter? It matters because you cannot do arithmetic on a character field. You can on, num on a numeric field. That's probably the most critical part. We'll see as we go through there are the other critical elements to that. But that's my product code. It's character. And finally, we have our amount. And it is numeric, and that's correct, but it's got two decimal places. If I take that back to zero again, you'll see on the converted example, it's showing the first line as 431. And we know it's 431.28. If I put my decimal places in, there's my 0.28. And when I'm happy with that, then I can move on. Now, if I wanted to create another field, I can do that. Let's say, for argument's sake, that we wanted to create um, an additional field which could be a discounted amount. Oops.
Now that field doesn't exist on the record. So it's not going to be a genuine field. It's going to be a virtual field. And what I'm going to do with that virtual field is I'm going to make it 10 characters with a two-digit di two um, decimal place. And I'm going to say that's going to be my discount if I offer it will be the amount times 0.1. I'm going to give them a 10% discount. Okay. I can add other fields, whatever I want. I didn't need to put in the length itself because it will automatically take that from amount. I can enter an equation to limit the data that's imported so that I can say of everything that's on there only give me customers above a certain amount or whatever it happens to be. And I can then say next. Having said that, I'll generate some field statistics as we go. You don't have to. If you're not going to use them um, then it's a waste of time. But most of the time we will typically use some form of field statistics, so you might as well do it when you're creating the file. And we'll finish on that. I'm going to replace the file because I already created it last time. And you can see there we have our invoice number, our date, our pay type, salesman, etc. There's the amount and there's that discount amount. I created. It's the virtual field that's showing up in blue and you can see that's 10% of the amount. If I change my mind on that field, I can adjust it by going into data, field manipulation, there's my amount times 0.1. I can change that and say it shouldn't be 10%, it should be 0 0.05 will give them a 5% discount. And it's now changed it down to a 5% discount. Okay, that's very useful from an audit perspective. If we have specific rules, I can actually create a field in there that says give them a 5% discount if, for example, the product code is 05, or give them a 10% if the product code is 02. And then having done that, I can then say, now we have the discount, for argument's sake, which the company has applied is actually on the file. I've created a virtual field, which is my calculation of the discount, now compare what I calculated with what the company has got on the file and show me any discrepancies. So anyone who's not getting the discount they're supposed to be getting, I can pick it up immediately. Okay. Is everybody happy? That's where we finished up on the last one. But we've taken it a stage further by creating a discount amount. Okay, now what we're going to do, I'm going to kill that file off. And if you remember, I simply go in over into my files and delete from over here. And this time I'm going to go back and do the same file but instead of doing it um, the way I just did, I'm going to go into the Advanced Record Definition Editor. And I will still pick up my sales file. But now it's taking me straight into here. And instead of drawing lines, I can go straight in and create my first one, which was my invoice number.
I can make it numeric because I know it is. I can change it from here, 1 for 7. No decimal places, no parameters, etc. And I can move on to my second field. And I can then say my next one is my transaction date. It's a date field. Starting in position 1, the length I know is going to be 8 digits. So it's moving it across. And when we're happy, I can move on. But it's looking for a date mask. So in here, I'm going to have to tell it year, 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 month, month, day, day. Okay, so it will automatically tell me you haven't put that in. You'll see up over here, what it's done is it's taken that field and it says, that's what it looks like if it's character, that's if it's numeric, that's if it's date. If it's a binary field, it would look like that. If it's a byte field, it would look like that. And it gives me all the different options so that I can look at it and I can see, well, actually, yes, it is a date field. It is a date field, and that's what it's supposed to look like, so I'm happy. Except for the fact that, once again, I missed the date name. So I'll change that back to transaction date. My next field, I know, was my payment type. I know that that is a numeric field, sorry, character field, and I know that it's three, four digits. My next field was my salesman, which was numeric for three digits. No decimal places. Next one was my customer number. My customer number again was numeric. And this time for five digits. My product code. Was character. And it was a two digit character code. And finally my amount was numeric and it was 11 characters long and it had two decimal places. Okay. And I can save it as sales.text already exists let me change that to sales2.text because I've already got that one in Do I want to import the current data file into IDEA? Now you've got a choice. You can bring it in immediately, or if you've got multiple files to define, you can do it that way and then bring them in as you need them. In this case, we'll just say yes. That's what it looks like. Generate my field statistics and finish. And this brought everything in. Okay. I haven't bothered defining the discount. If I wanted to, again, I can go back into data field manipulation and I can create another field 
append a field called my discount. In this case, I don't particularly need it, so I'm going to leave it. I can look at the history, and I can see that for that particular file, that's where it came from. That's where the record definition is. There it is there. That's the script code that was used to bring it in. And my field statistics has done it for all of the numerical fields, which is a bit ridiculous because I don't need a net value of invoice numbers. So I can take that one out, and I can take out the salesman, and I can take out the customer number because the only one I'm really interested in is the amount. So that's giving me my net values, my absolute value, number of records, positive values, negative values, etc. Again, I can look at that negative value and say, why have we got negative invoices? Which ones are those? There they are. A double click will bring it to me. If I want to see which are the negative records, a double click on the number will bring me the negative records. And I can either save it in a separate file for future reference, or I can print it, or I can say, well, I was only interested just now. If I want to see where the lowest value is, I can have a look at that record. And there it is there. I can have a look at the highest record. This is someone with a very high value American Express card. Three and a half million. That's a nice credit limit. It tells me which record is the minimum. That one. And which record is the maximum. And for those who get into statistics, it will show me my uh, standard deviation. It will show me my popular population standard deviation. Since I haven't sampled anything, the population and the sample standard deviation are the same. It will show me my variance, uh, skewers, uh, kurtosis, etc. Okay, we'll cover that in one of the later webinars. Okay, I can now go back to my data. And if I look at that field statistics again, we saw that that was record 223. If I go back into my data, and I go down to record 223, there's 223, and that's my minus 800. Okay. Everyone happy with that, I hope. Let's take a look at some of the other types of files that you're likely to get. So let's go back up to a file in our import assistant and we'll import to IDEA, but this time we're going to import a file which is an IPSIDIC file. It's still a text file, but it's coming from a mainframe. So the file I'm going to look for in my samples is one called IPSIDIC. And there it is there, IPSIDIC.dat. And if I import that one, it looks quite normal. If I change that to a fixed length file the way the other one was, that's what it looks like. This is not an ASCII file coming from a laptop or from a PC. This is an IPSIDIC file coming from a mainframe. And that's what it looks like. But it just looks like normal English. So again, I would use the same file layout until all the fields have been defined. So I can say next, saying it's a 73 character file. So again, I can say I'm happy with that. It says, where do you want to create your spaces? So I'll put one there. I'll put another one there. Okay. That's going to be my surname. That's going to be my initials. Then will come my account number for nine digits. Then will come my date. And then will be my amount. And I know that because, again, 
I've got the IPSEDIC file layout in front of me. And it's exactly the same process. It's coming from a mainframe. It makes no difference as far as ID is concerned. We can pick that up. We can say that that is a surname. We know its character. We're happy with that. We know that that's the initials. I might wonder why they've got a 20-digit or 21-digit field for the initials, but that's what they gave me. There's my account number. It's also character. Or is it? Once again, it will let you do it, but we know that it's not. It's numeric. Then comes my transaction date. And we know that that's a date field. And again, it's looking for that date mask, which is going to be our year, 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 month, month, day, day. Is that because that's what they gave me? If they gave me day, day, month, month, year, year, that's what would have gone in. If they gave me month, month, year, year, day, day, that's what it would have gone in. And over here, once again, we've got our amount, which is not character. You'll notice that when it's on character, it's showing it with the decimal point, because that's an alpha field. But I can't do arithmetic on it. It's not alpha, it's numeric. It says zero decimal places, 491. It's actually got two decimal, oops, two decimal places. So we're back to the correct one. I could add in more fields. I don't need to add in more fields. I could put an equation in to limit the data that's being imported. Exactly the same as before. I can click in there and say import if surname equals Smith or whatever it happens to be. In this case, I don't want it. So I can cancel. I can just move on to the next one. Do I want field statistics? Again, I'll take them. And there's my sales. Okay. Once again, if I look at field statistics, I've got the account number. I don't need statistics on the account number, so I'll take that off. And somehow in there, I have an account which is worth one penny. I've got three accounts which are worth one penny. Someone's processing transactions for one cent. So back to my data. OK. Everyone happy with how we got there? All we did was we went into File, Import Assistant, Import to IDEA. It becomes just so easy. As long as you've got that file record layout, then importing data is a piece of cake. But not every file is going to be like that. So let's take a look at what would happen if I was importing a file from an AS400 or an I-series. AS400s have a special file structure because they have a hardwired database management system within the computer. So we'll bring it in, we'll import it to IDEA, and it's coming in from an AS400. You'll notice this isn't highlighted. I can't click on anything there. I'm going to have to say next. And now it says, where is my input file? The reason for that is when you bring in from an AS400, you bring in the file and you bring in the input definition file. The two of them come together. One is the data file and the input definition file is actually coming from the data dictionary on the AS400. It's going to give me information about the information. So my input file will come from my samples file and it will be called AS400 DAT. My input definition file will also come from samples 
and you'll see there we've got AS400 DEF. That's the metadata, the data about the data. My output file, I'm going to call it AS400. And you can see it's already brought in all of these definitions. It's to find the length, it's to find everything. If I go in on my data and look at my field manipulation, it's already defined these. It says that one's character, that one's character, that one's... And it's picked them up and it's got... These have got no decimal place, that's got two decimal places. The reason it was able to do that was because it picked it up from that definition. That was already there and it brought it in for me. If I have a look at the field statistics, again, I can see all of the fields concerned, including the balance brought forward, balance, previous balances, balance adjustments, etc. I can go back into my data again. And to pick up a database file is as simple as that. What are these? These are whatever the file was defined as on the database management system on the AS400 itself. If I don't like CMPNY, I can change it by changing my column settings. I can change the colors. I can change anything that I want on there. I could also go in and say I want to hide that field. It's gone. But it's still there. I can still bring it back. Show all fields. And that's it back. I can stack them from the left. I can stack them from the right. I can freeze that in. So, that, for example, if I've got a field, let's say I take that one, and I say freeze that column, then if I moved, if this was a long file, with a long, field, a long record definition, so I'm going to drop off the end of it, I can freeze that in place so it won't drop off the end. So I can see all of the other parts of the record against that particular company or supplier or whatever it happens to be. I'll unfreeze the column. OK. And again, the same as we did last time, if we want to change the order, we can move that across. If I want to put it back, I can move it back. If I want to make the thing bigger or smaller, I can do it exactly the same as you would in anything else within a Windows-type environment. OK, everyone happy with the S400s? You may not have an iSeries computer. I keep using AS400 and iSeries interchangeably. Originally, IBM started with a computer called the System 38, which was unique because it had this hardwired relational database built in. In the fullness of time, they came up with a project called Project Silver Lake to decide where they were going with the System 38, and they renamed it and called it an AS400 ran with an operating system called OS 400 and it stayed as that for a while until it became renamed into the new iSeries which still runs the operating system OS 400. So it's still an AS 400 by any other name. Okay, let's look at a different file type. If you don't have an AS 400 that is obviously not of relevance to you unless the next company you work for, another common one, will pick up a DBase file. Okay. Now, unlike an AS400, when you import a DBase file, the metadata comes with it. So I don't need to specify which is my definition file. Again, I can put in my field name, types, etc. If I wish to add additional fields, and here's an interesting one. This is new. We can put a 
descriptive name for the database or simply click on, on import. We can link to save disk space and use that data file or we can import and bring it straight in. We're going to import it. You'll see it's already preset with generate field statistics. I'm not going to create a record number. I'm just going to say finish. And that's what's come in from my database file. And you can see again, it's showing my deleted column. And I can see there's nothing, there's no indicator in there that shows anything has been deleted. So do I really want that? Well, maybe I don't need that column at the moment, so I'll just hide that field. It's still there. I can always bring it back. I've got my account number. I've got my status. I've got my branches. Balance today. Balance yesterday. Again, if I want that sorted into branch order, I can just double click. If I want it in reverse order, I'll double click it the other way. And you can see over here we've built indexes, ascending and descending. If I want to change the ascending one, I can click to that. Descending, I can click to that. No index, I can do that. I can re-index it. I can delete the index and delete the index. Why bother creating and deleting indexes? If you're going to use them in a specific order, then it's a good idea to use an index. If you're not, then it puts an overhead on the machine to maintain that index, particularly if you're dealing with large files. So if you don't need one, don't create one. Just extra disk space, and as I say, extra overhead. OK, everyone happy with importing from DBase? Let's take a look at my old favorite. We're going to import from Lotus. Don't know if anyone's still using Lotus. Now, I'm going to pick up a file. You don't have one within your file. I had to create one in order for this to work. So I'm going to pick it up from my sample. And there it is there. You'll see that's a WK1. Lotus, depending on the version you've got, originally there were WKS, then with version 2 of Lotus became WK1, uh, version 3, version 4, etc. That's going to give me my 1996 records. So this is an old version from version 2 of Lotus. That's the table I'm going to import within Lotus. Maximum number of records I'm going to bring in is 1,000. I can generate field statistics and finish. And you can see it's brought in social services, current expenditure, field 2, field 3, and there's a whole stack of stuff that's been brought in with it. Okay. This is actual, actually figures from uh, London, from the local authority looking at expenditures in 1996. If I go back in and pull that in from the following year, by the following year, I can show you this because these are not my files. These are in the public domain that were put up on the internet. When I was going to show you this, I had to find a file that I could show you um, because IDEA doesn't have one in its samples area. So I had to download one. But again, I will go in and pick up a Lotus file from my samples. And this time, I'm going to pick up a Lotus 4 file. And that's the gross expenditures on the following year. I'm going to pick up import table A. If you've got multiple tables within it, it's the same as if you've got multiple 
uh, tables within an Excel spreadsheet. You can tell it which one you want to bring in. I'll bring it in, generate some field statistics. And here you can see in England, it's in thousands of pounds. And this is showing all the denominations. Once again, you'll see F16, F15. These are simply the numbering conventions coming out of Lotus. Unless I know what the layout of that field is, that could be meaningless to me. Now these are monthly expenditures, gross expenditures. Okay, so you can see how much of this each of these is costing per month. Obviously, if I'm moving along, I've lost sight of what that is. So again, I could go back to the start and I could say, okay, take that one and freeze the column. And now, as I move across, I've left that column frozen, and I can see exactly what I'm looking at. And to remove it, I can simply unfreeze the column. OK. Happy. As I say, I actually don't know anyone other than myself who still uses Lotus, um, but maybe you do. I've still got an old version of Lotus, and occasionally if I'm bringing in client information which is in a Lotus format, then I can bring it into Lotus. Okay, happy. Let's move on and take a look at Microsoft's offering. So this time we're going to import to data, but this time we're going to import from Access. And Access, again, is a database, so we're going to pick it up from an MS Access database and we'll go into our samples file and we'll pick up the one called Access. Now, I've got multiple tables, or I may have multiple tables. In this case, I've only got one, which is called Database, so I'll take that one. Um, scan the records for field length because there may be multiple field lengths within it. And now, as I move along, I've left the surname in place. I could leave the first name in place as well. Or not. I could have it frozen or unfrozen. I could take those two and say freeze both of them. Or by clicking in there I can unfreeze them. Okay. Everyone happy with that. If that was too quick for anyone, let me kill it off. Go back in and do it again. So we're going to go File, Import Assistant, Import to Data. I'm going to bring it in from Access. Okay. File name, setting my samples is Access. Happy so far. At the moment I'm scanning 10,000. I could say only scan a thousand or I could say scan them all. I'm bringing in one table called database. I could create a record number field and say OK. Is my record number. I brought them all in. So if I bring it all the way down, I've got 13,000 that I've brought in. If I had brought that in, you'll see over here it says 13,549. Let me kill that off again. I 
and I'll bring it back in again just to give you an idea. The file is called Access. This time I'm going to say only scan a thousand records. And you can see there I'm still sitting with that full number. So it's not telling me, it's not scanning as an import. It's scanning against If I go in and bring it in again, access, scanning the records for the field length. Now in this case I'm only bringing in one table. I know that they're all the same, so I'm happy. So I don't actually need to scan it at all. But I will. It's always safer to leave it in there. And that just covers for any abnormalities that might exist within the file. Okay. So when we say scan, it's not how many will be imported. It's how many are going to be scanned to check the field lengths. And even with 10,000, it's still bringing in 13,549 records. And again, statistics are not available for all fields. Do I wish to create them? Because I didn't say I wanted field statistics when I imported it. So I will create it, and it will create it for all my numerics. And again, I don't need country. I don't need the unit price. Quantity isn't really meaningful, nor the product code. The amount is, and the payment amount is. So I can leave those because I'm interested. As an auditor, I'm interested in these numbers. You might not be interested, in which case you might not need the field statistics. Okay. Everyone happy so far? I hope. If at any time you think to yourself, what was it he did there? He went too fast. I don't remember. I didn't see that. You can always go back when you get the video that's being made of this. You can always go back and play it again and see what was done. If at that point you think to yourself, well, I see what he did, but I don't understand why he did it. You've got two remedies. Number one, you've always got help. You can always ask for help and say, what am I doing here? I'm not quite sure. So if I want to find out how I handle an access database, well, I've got access. Micro ah, there's access database. That's not the same as access rights, no. That's access databases. And I can pick it up from there. Failing that, you'll be getting the contact details for both Jim and for myself at the end of this, and you can always contact us with queries. Okay. So let's press on. What else would we want to import information from? Well, it could be, and very commonly it is, coming in from Excel. Probably the most popular um, spreadsheet program that's in use at the moment, and a lot of information that auditors are getting, even out of mainframes, come in the form of, can you output it for me as an Excel file? And I'll take it from there. So we're bringing it in from an Excel file, and in this case, we're going to pick up our Excel file from our samples, and funnily enough, it's called sample. So we'll pick up sample. And you can see here we've got a multiple and multiplicity of web sheets that we could import. We've got a web log, we've got sales representatives, inventory, detailed sales, 
customers, suppliers, employees, etc. Well, the web log is interesting, so I'll bring that in on its own. Now, you can see here I've got column 1, column 2, column 3, and underneath it I've got site, date, time, user. So, I want to make that first row my field names. Okay. Empty numeric fields, do I want it to show zero or do I want them to be blank? I'll leave it at the moment. And I'm going to say OK. And that's pulled from a web log all of the people, how long they're online for, when they went online, and what files, or I'll try that again, what site, <coughs> sites they went online to. And we can see right away that we've got some interesting ones coming up on here. We've got games. Who's spending all the time on games? There's more games. There's more games. Is it the same people who are spending all the time on games? So what I could do is sort it into that order. And then I can look for gambling. Well, Jack Collins is obviously keen on gambling. Gambler. Also Jack Collins. Playboy. How long was he on Playboy for? That's interesting. Now, is that seconds, or is that minutes, or is that hours? I can't tell, because I don't know how it's been set up. So again, even though it's telling me the duration, I might have to go back and say, that duration field, what is it? Is it seconds? Is it minutes? Is it hours? Looking at it, I would guess it's seconds. But it might be that what is required in there I go into my data, into my field manipulation, there's my duration, it's numeric, eight digits with no decimal places. Maybe it should have two decimal places, I don't know. Let me look. Nope. So it's obviously not minutes dot seconds. So let me go back into my data, my field manipulation, and change that back. To zero. Let's put it back the way it was. So again, I'm going to have to go and follow that one up to find out. Okay. I can also, I've seen that our friend, the gambler, spends a lot of time. Basic jokes seems to be very popular with a lot of people. But equally well, I can look at my friend Jack Collins and see that he's been spending a lot of time on gambling. Does he actually do any work? Well, let's find out what Jack Collins looks at. So I can create by user. And then I can look up Mr. Collins. There he is there. Ah, okay, he doesn't always gamble. He also goes to games. Planet, planet clicks and business opportunities. Lotto. Doesn't actually look like he spends a lot of time genuinely working. Now, depending on what I want to know, will depend on how I interrogate the data. Okay, So in this case, we'll go back to no index. But I could also, from the same Excel spreadsheet, import to my data my idea. Things which are perhaps more interest to this particular audit. 
and in this case I'm not really interested in his web log. What I am interested in are perhaps sales representatives and detailed sales. Or it may be that I'm interested in employees and payments and customer and payments and bank, tran bank transactions. Whatever the purpose of the audit is, remember we start off with what is it you want to know, where is the evidence, and once you know where the evidence is, then you might use CATS to try and extract that evidence and make sense of it. So until I know what it is I want to know, I can't actually make sense of the data. In this case, I brought in my sales representatives, okay, and I've also brought in my detail. I'm going to take some of these out simply because I'm not using them at the moment. You can see they're still over here, I'm not deleting them. Don't really need the log file. And it's always useful to try and keep that middle area clear for the task that you're working on right now. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself confused when you end up with too much sitting in the middle there. But there's my sales representatives. There's my detailed sales. Okay, And you can see I've got my sales representatives there. And I've got my sales representatives there. Now, if I wanted, I can link these two together so that I can produce a report from here containing the names of my sales representatives. And we'll cover that in a later uh, webinar. But it's quite possible to do it, and there's different ways that we can do it. We can tie them together, we can link them together, we can merge databases. As long as we have a common field. OK. Everyone happy with Excel? There's an interesting one that you can do with IDEA, and that is you can also bring in a Visio file. Okay. A Visio file you can bring in. I'm going blind looking for it. If I go in on my samples, let me cancel that and leave that just now because I'm going to bring it in actually from ODBC. If I look at ODBC, now there's a problem with ODBC. ODBC stands for Open Database Connectivity. And these are relational type database records. And when you bring them from ODBC, you are constrained by the ODBC drivers that have already been installed on your machine. Okay, this is not on the mainframe, this is on the machine that you're using to interrogate. And you can see in there I've got DBase, I've got Excel, uh, I've got MQIS, I've got MS Access, I've got SQL, I've got Visio, Visio Fox Pro. I'm going to pick up a Visio database. Okay. And when I click on that, remember this is coming from a specific database, which is the samples database. This is what I have there. These are tables that I've got and I can choose from the tables which ones I'm interested in. Again, I could pick up, for example, airport seat locations. I can check the size to make sure that I've got enough disk space to import it if it's coming down directly from the mainframe onto my machine. I'm importing WAM, one big file or one big table. 
I've got room, so I'll bring it in. Again, there's my directory. I'm going to, I'll leave the field statistics at the moment. I'm just going to say finish. It may take several minutes to prepare your import if it's a lot of fields, etc. In this case, it's a fairly small file, so there it is. Okay. And there's all my airport seats. And you can see the seat number, the size, the length, the width, the height, whether it's business class or whether it's not, who's flying, what the ticket price was, how much baggage they've got, etc. Okay. Happy with that. It doesn't have to be Visio. Again, if I go into my import to, to data and I bring it in from ODBC, I can pick it up from any of those drivers. I'm not sure exactly what I've got on here, but let me just check. I know I've got an MS Access. There's Access, there's a DBase, there's Project Overview. I've got Overview and I've got Parent. I'll take the Overview. Say finish. Okay, so there's my overview for the, a particular project. Import data file using ODBC driver, then do duplicate file detect, duplicate key detection, then delete the database, etc., etc. And when it was done, and how it was done, and so on and so forth. Okay. So anything that's on there as an ODBC file, I can bring it in and I can then interpret it. And that's very powerful as far as um, using a tool like IDEA is concerned. As you saw, when you're importing conventional files, I keep slipping because I'm using a touchpad. If I bring these in, within text, I've got to define it. Within the advanced record definition, I've got to define it. Within AS400s, I've got to pick up two files. Within these ones, there is some control but with an ODBC, any ODBC database is going to suck it straight in, complete with all of the definitions. I don't need to do anything else with it. Okay, let's take a look at an XML file. And the file, again, that we'll look at, I'm going to pick up my orders detail from my samples folder. By now, you should be zipping through these and just going click, click, click. Obviously, I'm going a bit faster because I know what I'm looking for, but it's on the handouts that you've got. And again, I can look and see what I've got here. I've got data root. I can change the field name if I so desire. I can expand it see all of the information that's imported, these are all the order details, etc., or I can collapse it. In the meantime, I'm quite happy, so I'll just take it in as it is. And that's brought it straight in from an XML file. Okay, and again, I can see um, schema allocation, where it was actually which part of the schema it came in from the order ID, the product ID, the unit price. From a audit perspective, I'm not really all that interested in that, so I'll hide that field. And then I've got all of this information, and I can see it by orders, which products are in which orders, or I could sort it into order order, order order, does that make sense? And see which orders are ordering which products. So once again, it depends what it is you want to know. Okay. You can see there 
the one that I deleted, show all fields, says no name space schema location. And over here on the right hand side it says warning. As the schema file order details DB from access um, specified in the XML document could not be located, the data types for all the fields were determined by IDEA. Okay. So what this did was when it was bringing it in, because I don't actually have the full database available, it couldn't find that schema file. So it couldn't pick up the definition of is this numeric, how many decimal places, etc. So ACL has done its best to try and guess this out. Again, if it's wrong, I can find out what the field record layout is and then I can go to my field manipulation and change it. Okay. And I can equally well say I don't particularly want to look at that, delete it. I can override it by clearing the check view box or I can not override it. In this case I really don't care. I want to keep it there because I can just as easily hide it here and the fact that I know that it's there will keep me informed of this. Okay everyone happy. Okay, what I'm going to do now is take you through a different version. You won't see it on here. But I'm going to pick up a text file. Okay, a comma delimited text file. This you may, it may be all you get. Okay? If you're bringing it in from Excel or from another spreadsheet or from a non-spreadsheet, you can have a choice and they can give you a file which is comma delimited. Now what that means is instead of having 20 digits to put the name in and every name fits into a flat file structure with 20 digits, if you've only got a 10 digit name it only uses 10 digits and it puts an indicator to say this is the start of the name, this is the end of the name. Probably the most common one is commas. So we're going to pick up a comma delimited file. You may or may not have one. I created this one specifically for looking at this. And the one I'm going to pick up is interviewing. Now this, these are in fact the delegates who were on the interviewing skills webinar that I ran a month ago. Okay, so I will open it up and you can see it says delimited. It doesn't say fixed length. If I said fixed length, that's what would happen. I've only got three records. But in actual fact, it's not as comma delimited. It's not ipsodic. If it was ipsodic, it would look like that. But we'll stick, take it back to a comma delimited. So I can say next. Now what it's done is you can see attended comma first name comma yes comma Daryl comma rice comma. So what it's done now is it says the field separator, I think, is a comma. It might not be. It might be a colon, in which case we don't have any field separators. Comma, colon, semicolon, tab, whatever it happens to be, or any, anything else, depending on how the file has been created before you got it. So this is a comma delimited file, so we're happy with that. The first row is the field names, so we're happy with that. Next. And now I've got attended, it's character. I can tell it import or don't import it. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with the email. So I'll take the lot. And there's my spreadsheet showing all the people who attended with their email addresses, when they came, how long they signed, when they signed in, 
what state they're from, what organization, zip codes, etc. And that came in simply from an Excel spreadsheet which was common delimited. Now, many years ago I wrote a little system for myself for people who attended training courses. I wrote this back in 1976, I think it was, 76 or 77. And I wrote it in a hurry as a very basic course, a very basic system. And over the years, I keep looking at it and thinking to myself, I must go and change that. I must go and rewrite that. I must go and bring it up to date. And then I look at it and think, actually, it does everything I need it to do. So why change it? Well, what it doesn't have is it doesn't have an interrogation capability. I can't say, for example, which companies sent which people to which courses over the last five years. And that's the kind of thing that I was thinking about rewriting the system for. And then I thought, well, that's actually stupid because I've got idea. And I can simply use idea to interrogate the file and then sort it by year or sort it by customer or sort it by attendee within company within year or year within company within attendee. So I can use this purely as a data mining tool and a lot of companies are starting to do that. You'll notice the one that I haven't actually covered, well, there's two that I haven't covered in looking at this. I haven't covered SAP AIS, and I haven't covered print report and Adobe PDF, mainly because all those are print files, and that is what we're going to be covering in the next webinar. So if I go down. to approximately where we are. Because that covers the hands-on part for this week's. As I say, that is on the next webinar. Okay. You've got some choices. When you are using IDEA, you've got a choice. You can either sort or you can index. If I look, for example, what we've, oops, sorry, wrong button. What we've been doing up till now is we've been building indexes. So there's my index. What I could have done instead of creating an index is I could have gone in on my um, file and I could have sorted the data instead. And this time I want to do it by, and again I'll do it by product ID, ascending order, is going to create a file and that's the difference. And you can see we've got our order details and we've got our sorted details. Okay. And there are two separate files. Now in this case it really makes very little difference because they're both very small files. But if this was a big file that I'm going to have to go through, that could make a significant difference. So the difference between the two, to do a sort is a lot slower than to do an index. Index, I'm simply going to take the field that I want this thing sorted in order of, let's say the customer number, the linkage to the actual record, create a little file with just those two fields, sort the little file, and that's it. Now when I access the information, or when I put it up on the screen, it's going to look at the index file. That will tell it which record to bring up there 
then the next one on the index file that will tell it which is the re next record to put on the screen or the printout or whatever. A sort is slower because it takes the whole file and it sorts the whole file into that order. So it's slower to do. The resulting file si size is a lot larger. And because it's a lot larger, therefore, obviously, you need more disk space. But it depends what you're going to do with the information. If I'm taking an enormous file, let's say I'm taking a 300 megabyte file, an index for that file might only be half a megabyte. But every time I read that file, I've actually got two records to read. I've got to read the index, then I've got to read the record from the file. If I sort it, I've got a 300 megabyte file I started with, I've now got a second 300 megabyte file, the sorted file. But now if I'm going to read the whole file, I only have to read all of those records once. If that 300 megabyte is made up of 4 million records, here I have 4 million reads to do on the sorted file. Here I have 8 million reads to do on the indexed file. Read the index, read the file. Read the index, read the file. If I'm only going to process a few records, sorting the file, I'm sorting 4 million records, and now I'm going to look at 20 records out of that. That's going to take forever compared to sort of, uh, indexing the file and then just looking at those items on the index. So auditors are frequently caught with it, should I index it or should I sort it? And the automatic thing normally is just to index it. But there are times when it can be more efficient for multiple inquiries to process it with a sorted file rather than keeping hitting back on the index. Okay, so really it depends what you want to do with it and that is really where we start from. You've now got an idea of how to bring information in, some basics on how to manipulate the information. But when you're using idea, in order to decide what you're going to bring in and what you're going to do with what you brought in, first thing you have to decide is what is the objective of the project? What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to seek for fraud? Are you trying to ensure that all controls are in place? Are you trying to ensure that everything adds up correctly? What are you trying to achieve? Who owns the data? And who is the custodian of the data? Custodian is a person who's controlling it. That could be your information technology department, or it could be sitting on a server that's sitting under the control of finance. Wherever it is, who is the person in the user area or within an IT division who is overseeing that system from an IT perspective? Then you have to consider the data issues. What information do I want? Where will it reside? How will it be structured? How will I get to it? When should I ask for this data? And if I'm bringing in confidential or sensitive information, then I need to consider the security over the data files. What should be allowed and what shouldn't? First step in detecting, investigating and auditing for fraud you've got to get hold of the data. And that means you've got to identify what it is you're trying to find out and then arrange how you're going to get hold of that data onto your machine. Typically that means meeting with the owner of the data and with IT and then defining which fields on which records or which tables, what the layout will be, what the record layout of the file is, getting hold of that, when it's going to be transferred, how it's going to be transferred, and then once you've got it, 
you're going to have to verify that the data that you've got, that you think you've got, is in fact the data that you wanted. And it's a lot better to do that before you process it than to waste your time doing all kinds of analysis and then find out that you've been analyzing the wrong data for the wrong reasons or you've come to the wrong conclusions. I have stressed over and over again in these last two webinars, you need to know the format and the record layout of the file. Even if you're bringing it in from an ODBC database and everything's automatically going to come down, you need to know which table contains the information that you want to interrogate. And that information might be scattered over three or four different tables in different formats. So what format do you want to look at it in? The nice thing about it is you don't have to ask IT to write you an extraction program. I need to know what the format of the file is. I don't need to tell them I need the file in this format with this layout because whatever they've got, I can use IDEA to analyze it. But I do need to know what's coming. Once we've got it, then I can look for almost any type of anomaly which is data related. In other words, if it's in the data, we can find it if we know what we're looking for. So you've got to go back to square one and say, why am I looking at this data in the first place? What am I looking for? What am I trying to prove? Am I trying to prove that something happened? Am I trying to prove that something didn't happen? Or am I simply browsing the data because it looks like fun? So for example, on an inventory, I could take the raw data in and then I could calculate totals of inventory balances to see if that matches against what has been reported. I could calculate totals by product category to see stock movements and to see the amount of stock that we're keeping on hand, is it appropriate, etc. I could generate exception reports, looking for things like negative values, negative stock conditions, looking at quantities, costs, whatever I'm looking for. If I'm wanting to actually perform physical counts, I could select items from our perpetual stock records based on a statistical sample, whatever it happens to be, and then go and extract them and look at those. I can report any transactions that took place after a period end. I can do aging schedules. I can report inventory months on hand. Anything that I, can, that I could want to do, I can do. But once again, the trick is not to get the data and say, OK, which of these will I do? It's decide which of these do I need to know. Now let me go and get the data that will tell me that. Now let me do the interrogations. Acquiring the data, I need to ensure that that data is clean, that I've got all of it. When I'm looking at that file, am I looking at what I think I'm looking at? So we can use control totals and hash totals. In case you wondered why I kept going and looking at field statistics, the reason that I would look at those is I might be comparing these, the quantity and the discounts, to the records that are sitting in the user area. Simply to make sure that I've got everything. I know that I've got if I look at that one, I've got 2,155 records. Is that all there is? Or has something been kept in Department 99 that I know nothing about? I know the quantity that I've got on this file. Does it match what has been recorded? Because if not, one of them is wrong.
I can use data verification to make sure that only alpha ends up in alpha fields, only numeric ends up in numeric fields. I could clean up the data. If I end up with garbage sitting in a field, I can either exclude that garbage or I can um, amend it to make it work. Be careful if you're amending to make it work. It's very tempting sometimes to say, well, oh, look, the decimal point's moved in that field. I need to move it back to bring it in line or whatever. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's actually a fraud. You don't know. If you're going to clean it up, record everything you've cleaned. And if in doubt, you may have to go back to IT and say, listen, this record you gave me, the record layout, said that that should be a numeric field. I'm picking up alphas in there. Why? And maybe it is, in fact, an alpha field where I will need to extract the numeric part of that alpha field, of that character field. To get the data, I'm going to have to get access rights to it. And I need read-only. I don't need to be able to update this thing. IDEA will not allow you to update the live data. But regardless of that, not only have we got to be in the right, we've got to be above suspicion. So we only want read access. If IT will not give the access, and sometimes they're reluctant to give auditors access, in case we damage the system, then approach user management. At the end of the day, it's their data, and they can permit anyone they want to look at their data. I know that auditors have got carte blanche to look at anything you want. Keep that up your sleeve. Work through the system. And remember, you only need access to live data to interrogate it for the duration of the audit. Once you've audited the payroll system, you don't need access to the payroll system anymore till the next time an audit is done, and it might not be you that's doing it. So when you finish the audit, you want all of those access rights removed. Bear in mind everything you've loaded down to your machine, you are now responsible for maintaining the confidentiality of it. And in some cases, that can be extremely sensitive information that the auditor now has access to. So you may have to encrypt information that's sitting on your disk. You're certainly going to have to keep it secure. You certainly do not want your computer to be stolen with all of that information sitting on it. If you're keeping archive copies on the disk, you're going to have to have an encryption method. And there's a variety of those that you can choose from. When you're downloading, you can bring it down from the computer. If you're getting it from the mainframe, it's going to come down in Ipsidic. If you're getting it from the PC, it will come down typically in ASCII. You could be bringing it in from disk, and as we've looked at, there's a whole pile of different ways you can bring it in. It could even be coming in from tape. To get it, you need to know what is where. What data do you want? Where is it being kept? What disk is it on? Can you get read access into it? What does the data look like? and you'll get arguments against you having access to it. You have no right to look at those data files. Yes, you do. You certainly got no right to have a copy of them because you might not keep it secure. Yes, you can. You actually don't know what it is you want. If you know what you want to find out, then you can go and say, I am looking for the evidence of that. You tell me which files it's on. If you walk up and say, I would like to see all of the inventory records, and they say, why? And you say, because it seems like a good idea. That's not going to impress anyone. If we give it to you, you'll probably damage the data. doesn't matter. I'm not hitting the live data. And you won't understand what you're looking at. Yes, I will, because I know why I'm looking for it. Your counter-arguments. If you have to, 
As audit, we've got unrestricted access to any data we require to do this audit. You don't know what you're going to be looking at. We know what we want to know. You should be able to tell me where to find it. You'll damage the live data. No, nope, we want read-only access to make sure that we cannot damage the live data. And you won't understand what you're looking at. We also require the layouts of the data files, showing us which fields are where. You'll get further arguments and counter arguments. Tell us what you want. We'll extract it for you. Don't want it extracted. I want it raw. I want it as it comes. I don't want little bits of it extracted, especially for the auditors. Why don't we just give you a printout? Tell us what you want, and we'll give you a printout of it. Well, we'll look on the next webinar at how you can handle printouts when that's all you can get. But at the end of the day, we may want what's on the printout, but there may be another field that isn't on that printout that we also want. So we may need to analyze it several ways depending on what we find. So just give it to us in a data file. Oh, there's far too much data for you to look. You know, do you know you're talking about four million records? Have you heard of computers? Um, yeah, it's on the system somewhere, but, but we don't know how to access it. Well, tell us who does. So go and speak to them. But one way or the other, we want that data. You see, there's a problem because there's no actual way to access that data. If there's no way to access it, what the hell is it doing on the computer? What you're saying is that you don't know how to access it. And for that, tell us who does, and we'll go and speak to them. We don't have files that go for that far back. Well, how far back can you go? And right away, I've got a finding. Who decided the retention? How long records would be kept? And on what basis? Was it risk-based? Was it convenience? So, on that basis, you've given us the data. Now what? First and foremost, Make sure that the data is what you asked for. It may be, it may not. They may have tried to help and perhaps tried too hard and given you more than you wanted. If they want that, they'll probably want this as well. Let's give them everything. Does it reflect the right period? Is it the live data that we're looking at or is this a different version of it? Is it all there? Because number one, it's embarrassing. And number two, it's, it damages your professional reputation to come to an adverse conclusion and say there are problems here. And they say, oh, oh, sorry, I think we gave you the wrong file. Or why are you looking there? It's the wrong layout. It's even worse if there is something wrong and you came out and said there isn't. So you need to check it against anything that's currently known. Control totals, dates, transaction lists. At the end of the day, never believe what the first person or the first printout tells you. It looks like the right data. Now what? Well, <clears throat> if you started off knowing what you wanted to find, and from that you derived where the data resided. Now you've got the data. So you can go ahead with the analysis you plan. You should not be asking for the data and then trying to figure out how you're going to analyze this. You start off with, what do I want to know? How am I going to find out? What analysis will I have to do? What data do I need to do that analysis? Here's the data, do the analysis. Now you've got the answer. Once you've got the answer, check it. Remember what I said? Never believe what the first printout tells you, particularly if it's telling you what you want to believe. 
if all you can get is the hard copy, can they print it to a file instead? If possible, give me a comma delimited. Fred Smith, comma, internal audit, comma. Because, as you see, we can bring it in, we can identify the fields, and we can take it that way. If it's a printout, we can scan it. If we scan it in, we get a single field of 120 characters if it's a 120 character printer. And then we can take it in there and we can have multiple layers, multiple layouts for different roles. On the next webinar, we're going to look at exactly how you do that, whether it's coming in from a print file or whether it's coming in from a PDF file. How do I pick it up, structure it, and get it into a format that I can analyze? And that brings me to the end of this particular webinar. Are there any questions? Well, thank you, Richard. This was, uh, this was terrific, and I'm sure that there's a lot of great information. Uh, I, like, uh, I like your comment back at the beginning where you said if you're uncomfortable or you forget something, you can play it again. And I'm a big, uh, big fan of Humphrey Bogart. And play it again, Sam. Play it again. You played it for her, you can play it for me. So basically, if you've looked at this webinar and you have some questions about what to do, how to do it, play it again. That's the way to get it done. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to receiving any questions that you might have. Please send them to either uh, Richard Cascarino or to myself, to auditnet.org. We'll be glad to answer those questions. Uh, the purpose of our Training Without Travel webinars is to provide you with high-quality, low-cost, online alternative training solutions covering timely topics with value-added resources and tools that you can use in your job. We bring the world's best subject matter experts, including Richard Cascarino, directly to your desktop with timely information. Richard has just published a new book, and I'm sure that uh, you'll be able to find information about that on AuditNet, so look for that in the future. Uh, the next webinar in this series will be on, Richard, help me out here. I believe it <laughs> is. My mind has gone blank. It's going to be looking at importing from PDFs, print files, etc. Ah, very good. So for information on the remaining webinars, just visit auditnet.org and, uh, and look for the link in the navigation column on uh, IDEA software training. And we look forward to having you join us. Thank you, Richard, and have a great day. Thank you. And thank you all for being there.